This video is a collaboration with my good friend Weebcrit. In their video, they take an in-depth look at the history of nationalism in Japan and America, and how nationalism has impacted both nations. And together, we look at how it plays into anime, and particularly a favorite of ours, Naruto. They've got some great videos and critiques on anime, so go and give them a watch and subscribe. First though, let's discuss nationalism. To steal from Weebcrit, I'll also be defining nationalism as the personal or socio-political ideology prioritizing national welfare, the status of the so-called nation-state over individual welfare, the status of individuals comprising it. This allows for a spectrum of nationalism. It's important to note that nationalism is not inherently good or bad. Throughout history, there were many instances where nationalism was used for, say, anti-colonial purposes. Fanon with the Algerian colony in France, or Lumumba and the independence of the Congolese folk from the Belgians. Nationalism does not hold a particular morality. Understood in this way, Bernard Yak, author of Nationalism and the Moral Psychology of Community, notes that nationalism derives its moral qualities from the causes and characters of its proponents. Nationalism doesn't kill people, nationalists do. The power of nationalism, argues sociologist Anthony Smith, should be attributed to the fact membership in a nation provides a, quote, powerful means of defining and locating individual selves in the world through the prism of the collective personality and its distinctive culture, as he wrote in his book, National Identity. In Naruto, in The Leaf in particular, there is a great sense of pride in the villagers of this nation, and most, if not all, citizens believe in the national identity of the leaf. Based on several definitions of national identity, it is one that encompasses both political and cultural components, history, national consciousness, and language, all to compose a sense of belonging for the people who belong in that nation. The leaf's national identity is so powerful and all-consuming, making its villagers' devotion and nationalism stronger than ever. Since the leaf is a shinobi village, let's take a look at the connection between shinobi and the ideology that they are so enamored with. Shinobi are not just people who defend the village. Their existence is much more than that. Shinobi are the main military power for their affiliated nations, and they can bolster a nation's economy and political prowess when one land is particularly strong in battle because strength attracts outside commissions from those wealthy enough to purchase their services. So more than the loyalty and honor that these shinobi are supposed to have, they also exist as these heavily politicized figures, as tools of greed and elitism to bring wealth and status to other allied nations. Shinobi villages are breeding grounds to create people who know nothing except for loyalty, honor, and how to fight, deceive, and lie. They are the ultimate tools of the state, but on a personal level, being a shinobi is a continuous act of severance, separating oneself from one's own heart and giving oneself wholly to a nation, to a government, to something bigger. Being a shinobi is self-sacrifice. As Haku says it, as full-fledged shinobi, their philosophy is that they are expected to kill their own heart with their blade, just as the kanji, the word shinobi, was originally the words heart and blade. Ninja are not only expected to remove their emotions towards their opponents in battle, but any emotion towards their own friends, comrades, and even families, if it doesn't serve their nation. Rule 25 of shinobi conduct is that no matter what happens, true shinobi must never show their emotions. The mission is the only priority. Carry that in your heart and never shed a tear. These are rules that shinobi of every village follow, rules across the entire shinobi world and some villages have it worse than others. The Bloody Mist students, for example, were forced to fight to the death to graduate. Kisame, back when he was a shinobi, was of course tasked with killing his own comrades to ensure that valuable information didn't get leaked. These children are made into these fighting machines while still having to bear the weight of their humanity. They are humans with wants and needs, humans who yearn for connection. They are taught that they shouldn't be concerned with the reason for their own existence that they only exist as tools for their nations. But bubbling underneath the surface of their minds, Kakashi says, disturbing them, is that purpose. What type of person are they if they can kill their own comrades in cold blood? A thought that the White Fang once had. Almost every non-rogue shinobi we see has at least one companion with them. Teams of three, teams of four, we've even seen rescue units with eight members. We don't see it, but they spend days, weeks, and sometimes months traveling with each other going to foreign lands, breaking bread together, protecting one another. 
And yet, a shinobi should be able to sever any connection should the nation ask for it. Because their own reasons for existing, for living, do not matter. Because they are tools for the state. A big part of it has to do with their deep indoctrination. What else do these shinobi know but their jutsu or their ninja weapons? What else do they know but how to deceive and manipulate? How to sacrifice? For the leaf, the greatest ninja of their times, the Hokage, their faces are immortalized in stone, watching their every step. Every day when they step out of their homes, these figures are larger than life. How can we not grow up with this goal in mind? This desire to be remembered, to be a village hero. To quote Smith, Membership in a nation promises individuals redemption from personal oblivion. In a secular era, Smith argues, identification with the nation is the surest way to surmount the finality of death and ensure a measure of personal immortality. Professor Yael Tamir makes a similar point in the enigma of nationalism, arguing that As long as the nation endures, it will show gratitude to all who struggle and sacrifice their lives for its survival. It will turn them into heroes, perhaps canonizing them even if they come from a vile or a noble background. In this sense, nationalism is an egalitarian ideology, as is best illustrated by the uniformity of military cemeteries, where rich and poor, educated and illiterate, all lie below identical tombstones in a paragon of equality and fraternity. The village promises that no matter what family you came from, no matter what circumstances you were made in, if you sacrifice yourself for the state, you can gain that love, that admiration that immortality. There is nothing that will bring you more satisfaction, nothing that will bring you more joy, and most of all nothing that will bring you more honor than protecting the village. But if a shinobi has that bubbling ideal that has now risen to the surface, and they no longer believe in the national identity, what happens if they want to, say, leave the village? Quickly we learn that there are consequences for questioning one's identity. Should a shinobi leave the village without approval, there is a chance that they will get branded as a rogue shinobi because they've abandoned their duties, which is a criminal offense. There is also a chance of being hunted down or killed for the information they possess about their village. So if you can't desert your village for fear of being hunted down, if you don't believe your village's ideals, what choice is left? There are two options. Sakumo Hatake took his own life because he felt as if there was no other choice. He was clearly unhappy with Konoha's ideals and took it upon himself to save his comrades instead of the mission. But he could not manage the pain of being relentlessly humiliated and shamed by his own people for choosing his friend over the state. And so he could not bear it, perhaps not only for his pride and honor, but for his son's future. So he took his own life. Shisui Uchiha did not agree with the Konoha council. He didn't agree with the nation, and so he was met with Danzo's wrath, who took his eye. He knew that they would kill him for his other eye, so for him, death was his only option. It goes to show that no matter how talented you might be, no matter if you already work for the state, for the government, the nation will only see you as a tool and want to still be used even after your death, if you cross them. Shisui felt that he would be hunted until the day he died, and so he took that control into his own hands and took his own life. Being a shinobi in Naruto is like an act of seppuku because of one's willingness to sacrifice oneself for their country. Danzo when fighting Sasuke tells him about Itachi and he tells him specifically that self-sacrifice is what it means to be a shinobi. York professor Toyomasa Fuse suggests that there is a sense of autonomy and authority when it comes to seppuku. He writes that in natural death caused by aging, therefore death will come to the person unavoidably and externally. You are the passive and helpless victim of nature's inevitability and fate. But the voluntary seppuku involved on elaborate and rational planning as well as a psychological preparedness in the form of willingness to die for a cause. In this process, the samurai is the active agent for his life and death. To wit, he holds total mastery on his life or death. In seppuku, he is the active agent who will bring about his own death with his own decision. Unlike the natural death in which one is a powerless and helpless victim of nature's whim. It is not God or fate or the inevitability of aging, i.e. other agents than one's own self that will bring death. It is rather the man himself who will hasten or bring about the termination of his own life with his own volition and choice. 
With this line of thinking, those shinobi who feel that they have no control over their lives can at least persuade themselves with this illusion of control, with this illusion of agency. At least this way they can sacrifice their lives for, say, honor or something greater than themselves. But as Weebkut writes in their critique of this very idea of honor and death, they say that, quote, honor in death is nothing more than an afterthought, and in reality, none of the hard work of nation building or maintenance is done by dead men. The living, and especially women, children, and any colonized refugee or otherwise directly impacted populations are left alone to answer the radically complex and practical questions of rebuilding the nation after war. For Donzo here and for Itachi, those who have forsaken their lives for their nation, they do not have to deal with the consequences of what they've left behind. It's characters like Sasuke and Tsunade, and all the rest of the living, they are the ones who do. So many ninja in the Naruto world believe that they hold total mastery of their own lives and thinking, when they are in fact barred from ever challenging the systems that power their world. But thanks to the will of fire, more often than not, most shinobi believe in its collective power. As Weebkrit eloquently puts it, Good citizens, but particularly men and boys, do not hold their own moral or political aims. They are ceaselessly loyal to their nation, no matter what it's fighting for, which is often unstated. Bad citizens have moral or political motivations that deter their wholehearted commitment to the village, often resulting in their abandonment of the village identity, or in the case of Sakamo. Both of these are reinforced by the will of fire, which is said to reside in those persons who die or otherwise commit their lives in service to the village. In that sense, the will that's embodied in the will of fire is that of the nation, not of the individual. As a child, Hashirama knew that there was something inherently wrong with the shinobi world, as he buried his own younger brothers because of the wars that they, the children, had no real stake in. Thus, the creation of a village that would allow children to actually be children and not have to fight in the wars of adults was born. A dream that he was willing to die for. This dream turned into the village, and then the village's ideal would then become the will of fire the day he decided to kill his best friend to protect said dream. Shinobi uphold this idea, and the will of fire is the belief that the village matters more than one's own blood, because the village itself will always protect its own, and more than that, they will protect its future. Madara predicted this would be a mistake, and in the future mentions how Hashirama's nation building bore a paradox. He has created a nation who kills in order to find peace. Hashirama set a violent precedent. To quote Weebkrit once again, they write, this is a great example of how nationalism breeds militant protectionism, as we observe the emergence of a national village identity that transcends the value of the people within it. This is ironic, since what is a village if not the collection of people housed inside of it? A village identity implies the existence of a non-village other, which threatens the purity and safety of the village should they come and interfere. This is one of the rationales for both colonialism and strict immigration policies, which we can observe throughout Japanese and American history. Hashirama's will of fire became the country's national identity, a country built then on militant protectionism and sacrifice. A country that would do anything to protect itself by any means necessary. History professor Dr. Fujitani in the Meiji at 150 podcast says that we need to come to grips with the price of nationalism. Though it can be healthy in cases like those mentioned, it carries a logic with many negative repercussions. He says that there is an inherent berserkness to it, that needs to be tempered and quelled before it transforms into something dangerous, like racism or fascism, or into what we see happen in Naruto. The Leaf Village is a representation of these repercussions, and the Uchiha clan becomes the one outstanding casualty, the one major blight on the national identity of the Leaf. Hashirama once suggested that an Uchiha become Hokage, after the death of Madara, no Uchiha would ever come close to not only becoming Hokage, but even earning a seat on the Konoha Council, the elders that make the most important decisions regarding the village. No Uchiha were ever even advisors to a Hokage. Instead, Hashirama passed his role down to his brother, who believed that the Uchiha were an inherently dangerous people. Tomirama has always had a problem with the Uchiha, dating back to his battles with Izuna and especially with Madara Uchiha. Being given now the opportunity to protect the village by any means necessary, being given that blessing by Hashirama, it gave the second Hokage free reign to uphold the village identity 
and to continuously fight against the quote, other, even if that other lived in the very same village he governed. To Tobi Rama Senju, the Uchiha threatened the safety of their village, and so, like those who would come after him, he did what he felt was necessary to protect his brother's home. Nationalists tend to create their own narratives to interpret historical events in the way that fits their needs, to renew languages artificially, to mimic other nations, and to appropriate foreign traditions as their own. Motivated by a desire to connect their nation to a remote and illustrious past, nationalists do not hesitate whenever necessary to invent such links. We see that with his countless theories about how the Uchiha are a clan predisposed to evil and to hatred. And with that thought, Toburama created the police force and gave it to the Uchiha, thus ostracizing the clan from the other village members, not only physically but psychologically. The isolation of the clan gave Tobirama a place where he could keep his watchful eye on the clan, quote, possessed by evil. These destructive narratives about the Uchiha were pushed along by the following generation, most notably Tobirama's student, Danzo Shimura. Danzo saw the clan as nothing but bodies belonging to the state, and he treated their eyes as such. All the while, he and the other Konoha elders blamed the Uchiha for the Ninetale attack. At the core of it all, the second Hokage, as well as Danzo, did not believe that the Uchiha clan carried the same level of loyalty and dedication to the village as they did, even though the Uchiha themselves willfully chose Hashirama as their leader back when the village was being created, and they cast Madara out. Throughout the Leaf's history, the Uchiha are positioned as anti-Konoha out of fear. The way Tobirama speaks about them, calling them scoundrels, using coded language, claims of their genetics being inherently evil, again and again he nor Danzo are ever challenged by the narrative. But when Uchiha shows genuine emotion because, say, their brethren were slain in war, they are positioned as the villains, and that is always extrapolated to them being against the village. As understanding as Hashirama was in his early days, the Senju created the narrative for the leaf. History is decided by the victors. Nations and narratives are also decided by the victors. And while Danzo was orchestrating the demise of the Uchiha, the third Hokage stood idly by. He allowed the clan to be blamed, and he allowed their relocation to the outskirts of the village. This passivity is a component of nationalism. It falls on Sarutobi and the other members of the Konoha Council. On nationalism, ethnic cleansing, and genocide, author and professor Danielle Conversi writes that there is a bystander role in genocide that can occur where the apathy and heedlessness of international audiences and indifference towards collective rights and dignity can feed the machine of mass destruction. Philosopher Hannah Arendt famously explained how the key element of genocide is not inter-ethnic hatred, as commonly assumed, but simple indifference towards fellow human beings. Passivity and indifference make up the raw material of genocide. The darkness that nationalism can bring forth has been accompanied by some of history's most violent episodes of ethnic cleansing, generally of minorities that were considered disloyal to the nation or suspected of collaborating with its enemies. The Ottoman Empire, the Holocaust, the Hindus and Muslims of India and Pakistan in 1947, and others. Itachi and the fate of the Uchiha clan is the prime example of nationalism in Naruto, nationalism at its most extreme. But for me, the most alarming part of it all is how the story portrays this massacre. After chapter 399, Itachi's actions are praised by the narrative. He is given so much grace. Naruto hails the man as a hero. In chapter 549, Naruto mentions how Itachi made himself look like the quote, bad guy, to save Sasuke and Konoha. Naruto doesn't bat an eye that this man committed genocide in the name of their village. Instead, he says that Itachi has done enough for the village. Hashirama, after hearing all that Itachi did in the village's name, he calls the young Uchiha a shinobi even greater than he was. Is it not odd that the first Hokage praises a child soldier for killing his entire bloodline? Is it not alarming that this idea is never confronted or really fought against? Is there no commotion for the fact that blind loyalty is promoted and lauded over the lives of real people? When these lines of support are spoken by your protagonist who is supposed to be both the moral compass and the moral paragon of this series, you are giving Itachi and the Leaf a pass for genocide. Bernard Yak writes, Nationalism does not teach us that we can do no wrong when we act in service of the nation or that we should be indifferent to the suffering of those who oppose the members of our community. 
but it does dispose us to act as if we did believe these things by lining up calculations of interest, feelings of communal loyalty, and beliefs about political legitimacy against the members of rival nations. In doing so, it makes many ordinary members of a nation much more willing to go along with the relatively few individuals among them. The fanatics, the xenophobes, the self-seeking political entrepreneurs who do not recognize any moral constraints on our treatment of the members of other nations. Nationalism, I am suggesting, has a subtly insidious effect on our moral judgment. Rather than directly challenge moral restraints on our treatment of others, it corrodes and weakens them. Nationalism doesn't kill people, nationalists do. The most targeted, the most vulnerable group, the base of this story, are the children. Kakashi in chapter 35 of Naruto clearly states that he does not see the children of the leaf as children. They are soldiers. Even more than that, these child soldiers are the very vehicles that the leaf uses to promote nationalism, as they are ground zero for building up national identity and collective identity. They are the ones being taught that their village, their code matters more than any other and that the honor of their villages supersedes everything. In the tuning exams, we see exactly that in Saratobi's speech. They fight to the death to help fulfill the dream that was envisioned by their ancestors. The youth and youth culture are often primary movers of general culture and sentiment. They are the ones who popularize movement and change. In Naruto, they are the most loyal and dedicated shinobi in every sense. Itachi Uchiha again stands as example number one. Because he was a child of war, Itachi was molded and manipulated into becoming this perfect shinobi by both the third Hokage, the state, and by Danzo's Anbu. A shinobi who at seven years old, seven, was ready to sacrifice his heart for the village. Kakashi, as much as he is revered throughout the story, he is also one of Konoha's greatest soldiers. He is another victim of Konoha's nationalist ideals. Kakashi, who found his father's lifeless body as a result of the weight of the shinobi creed. Kakashi, whose best friend died as a child because he was thrust into the war of adults. Kakashi, whose other teammate also died young, who also took her own life, jumping in front of his own attack because she too was a child thrust into the war of adults, but she was carrying a weapon of mass destruction inside of her. And Rin chose the village over her own life, a child. And despite everything, this same Kakashi remains fiercely loyal to the village hidden in the leaves. The leaf and its nationalist ideals have ripped all of Kakashi's loved ones away from him and have left him with a depression that is subtly evident in the way that he carries himself and in some of the words that he says. Surrounded by death and loss, Kakashi has nothing else but to give himself to his nation. He's got nowhere to go, nowhere to run. Again, just like seppuku, at least Kakashi can gain a semblance of autonomy and control in a life where he has had none. Kakashi, Tachi, Naruto, and Sasuke, they are all victims. They are the examples of why Konoha places their faith and their trust into children. Because children are easily moldable. You teach them that they are tools and they will become the sharpest. You tell them that it's either their clan or the village and they will believe that there isn't a third choice. These nations promise glory companionship, revenge, and being a ninja devoted to your country is the best way to not get othered. It's the best way for Naruto to be seen, to be loved. And we must extrapolate these ideas to every genin and jonin that have ever been raised in the village, in all the villages across the Naruto world. To go even further, Naruto, Gara, Rin, Nohara, all extreme examples of tools for their nations, as they were all once Jinchuriki, walking weapons of mass destruction, children in service to their countries. They are symbols of political power and used as pawns on a chessboard for the greater battles between these nations. The Chunin exams are nothing but an arena wherein young shinobi fight possibly to the death for the honor of their lands. But is honor worth the death of children? The very thing Hashirama was so against when he was first building this village. The Genin of the Leaf are told this directly, and still none of them bat an eye at this nationalism. But can you blame them? This is the after effect of raising child soldiers. They've got unquestioning loyalty to the state. The Konoha has effectively snuffed out any sort of individual thought that could have crept past the village. 
and the narrative plays a major role in highlighting which perspectives should be admired and which should be condemned. Naruto himself at the beginning of the series in the Land of Waves arc was firmly against the stance of shinobi being emotionless tools for their country. He even cries and breaks the shinobi rules and creeds of being closed off and emotionless, his emotion even bringing Zabuza out of tears. And yet, this very same protagonist, this very same kid, hails Itachi as a hero for cutting off his own heart and choosing the village above everything else. The narrative praises those who make these kinds of sacrifices those who can endure for a nationalist cause. Danzo, who has had a hand in nearly every single political conflict and act against every other nation, is given a fairly clean death, and his actions are even romanticized by the narrative, as he claims he did everything for the village. The story is so eager to place a character like Danzo as this morally grey person, because of what he did for the village, and in that same light, clearly condemn the Akatsuki or Madara and leave very little room for their perspective, for their own hunt for peace and justice. Sasuke is one of the greatest examples of this framing. Is Sasuke wrong for not forgiving Konoha? Is he wrong for not wanting to follow Itachi's path of blind loyalty to a village that had him give up not only his childhood but his entire life and family? Is Sasuke's anger not justified? Instead, Sasuke's anger is often seen as worse than the actions that led him to this point. The oppression, the abuse, the ethnic cleansing that all precedes his desires are made to seem as if they pale in comparison to what he would do. That what was done was all necessary. Again, the Akatsuki are made up of shinobi who have all left their villages. Almost all of their motives are because they are victims of their country's nationalism or of the shinobi system. Sasori, Kisame, Kakuzu, Itachi, Konan. They have all suffered because of what their nation's pride did to them. But none are given the grace that, say, Danzo is given. This is the perspective that the story tells us. The narrative tells us that we must sacrifice in order to achieve our goals, but it tells us that it ultimately doesn't matter what those sacrifices are as long as they are for the village, as long as they are for something greater, even if that sacrifice is human lives. Konoha specifically and the rest of the Naruto world has been built up through a nationalist ideal, and it has not changed. The three trailblazers of the Naruto world are Hashirama Senju, of course Naruto himself, and Sasuke. Three people who were strong enough to change the world, to alter the shinobi world. Hashirama, despite acknowledging the need for children to not be soldiers, and acknowledging the inherent faults that lie in the shinobi system, his village became a shinobi village, thus giving the shinobi system a foundation to build on. Naruto and Sasuke had a chance to change the shinobi world, to beat down upon the systems that have impacted their very lives. The reason Naruto is an orphan with a weapon of mass destruction inside of him. The reason he was bullied and ostracized as a kid. At least Hashirama tried. At least he had an ideal in mind. But for Naruto and Sasuke, the two who truly had the chance to change the shinobi world, to change the system, they didn't even try. The system that thrives on nationalist ideals and its berserkness continues, never to be again challenged as it once was back in the very first arc. As much as we love this series and are enamored by its many fascinating characters in the world and this story, it's important to look critically at the messages that these stories send. It's essential to ask questions, like why is Itachi hailed as a hero, and why doesn't Naruto challenge the systems that have oppressed him and his loved ones? Now, whether the author believes in these ideas and themes or not is up to them, but we as an audience have a duty to think about these stories critically and form our own opinions on what these themes and messages are and whether we agree or disagree with them. The point is that it's okay to challenge the artist. Here, Weebcrit and I have asked why this story in particular upholds the values that it does, and we continue to ask if these are the correct messages to be sending to the youth, and in particular young boys, so that the next generation can have stories that challenge the status quo in unique and healthy ways, so that there exists a place where stories don't necessarily always have to parallel real life, especially for the young boys of the future so they can imagine a future where self-sacrifice isn't a part of their identity, where they don't have to live up to the incredibly demanding and often self-harming ideals of the past and sometimes present, so they can imagine a future where they can just exist. Naruto is about many things, I think. 
a series about friendship, bonds, sacrifice, a series about love like I once said. But this This isn't love. This is not friendship, it's not sacrifice. These are not bonds. This is the price of nationalism. 